there's, there's many familiar faces in this room, so it's nice to be here and to have the opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in Ecuador, which uh, many of you um, in the room and students from CU will be engaged in, so it's really, really a pleasure. Um, so I've been doing work in Ecuador on emerging infectious diseases for the last 10 years in partnership with the Ministry of Health and the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology. My background is in ecology uh, applied to these diseases, so I work with a lot of really smart doctors and immunologists and public health people, but my background is more on systems ecology, understanding how social, climate, and disease drivers come together to explain disease transmission dynamics. These are two examples, we're going we're gonna to sort of talk about these two different scenarios as we go through the slides. Um, in Ecuador and in many places in the tropics, we have endemic infectious diseases like waterborne disease like cholera, typhoid, leptospirosis, and vector-borne diseases, which I'm sure many people, everyone in the room has heard of Zika at this point, and if you've heard of Zika now, you've probably heard of dengue and chikungunya sort of as a, as a, as a byproduct. But dengue has been around a lot longer in the Americas and is a major, major public health issue. So that's been the focus of my work. And now, anyone who does work on dengue also does work on chikungunya and zika. So of course, all of our, our work has been expanded. So these are two photos I took uh, while doing field studies in Ecuador. The photo on the left is a community that was built right on the urban periphery. So this is a mid-sized city, which we'll talk more about where most of our studies are based. And these are, so you know, right just outside there's paved roads, you know, sort of a very, very urban area, this is not rural, but because it's right at the urban periphery, these houses um, were not legally recognized, they were sort of uh, illegal settlements, and so they don't have access to all the legal infrastructure like paved roads, electricity, piped water. And so this little line, that tube there where the arrow is, that's their piped water source. Um, and that's also where all of the sewerage from the houses goes straight into that water body. So you can imagine what would happen when we have massive flooding or, or droughts, you know, either scenario, and how that interacts with the social conditions in these areas. On the right-hand side, thank you. I'm a laser, so I don't do so much hand waving. On the right-hand side, this is a photo we took, well, it was doing one of our first field studies on dengue in, um, in Guayaquil, which is the largest city in Ecuador on the coast. And we were going house to house and surveys looking for containers where the mosquito that transmits dengue, zika, chungunya resides. And this is an urban container breeding mosquito. And so in this household, these were the containers that they had in the kitchen. This is in the corner of the kitchen of the house. And this is the same water they used for cooking, cleaning, um, bathing. And these containers were uncovered. And so of course the age of the mosquito was happily thriving in these containers. The adult mosquitoes emerge, feed on people in the house, and the whole life cycle of the mosquito and the virus persists in this peri-urban environment. And people store water or don't store water depending on climate conditions also. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think these are sort of two good examples of how social and climate factors interact to influence uh, disease risk. So my work, since I came to SUNY Upstate, um, uh, started in 2012 when I was raised I've been almost five years working with SUNY Upstate. My work was to develop the work we've been doing in Ecuador and create a long-term research collaboration or research platform in partnership with institutions in Ecuador, we are, where we are strengthening disease surveillance systems, and we are able to do a broad range of different kinds of epidemiological studies in partnership uh, with researchers and institutions down there. And this is what I call a social ecological or systems approach. And so we are measuring nutrition, vector abundance, virus, immunological markers, a whole range of factors, microclimate, to be able to characterize disease transmission. And we're integrating this information through different modeling techniques. And part of one of the goals is to be able to generate some of the evidence base for how climate affects health. This is one of my, more, one of my focuses. And then how do we develop interventions based on this information? So very briefly, a little bit of background on dengue, although this may be familiar to many of you. Dengue is transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, by the female mosquito, which is a container breeding urban mosquito. Aedes aegypti is distributed all throughout the tropics and subtropics. Aedes allopictus is a secondary vector, although less important in these regions. You have four strains of the virus that co-circulate in areas where the disease is endemic. So you have dengue one through four. So if you live in a place like Machala, Ecuador, you could have, you could have multiple dengue infections in your lifetime. Although it's important to note that 
when you are affected by one serotype, it's thought that you have immunity to that serotype, so then you could have a dengue one infection this year and a dengue two infection next year. When you have your second infection, you're more likely to have severe hemorrhagic symptoms, um, which is more associated with death. Uh, and I'll show a little bit of the data, the results from our, our field studies linked or supporting that. And, um, but it seems like after you have your second infection, there may be some sort of natural vaccine or natural immunity that occurs, so you don't often see third or fourth infections. There is a lot of work happening right now worldwide to develop dengue vaccines. Um, Sanofi Pasteur is, is going through motions to license their dengue, the first dengue vaccine in Mexico and in Brazil this year, although it has limited efficacy and works better for certain age groups, works better for people who have already been exposed to the disease, so it's definitely not a perfect vaccine, but it is still a major, major milestone. And there are many, many other groups developing dengue vaccines, including our team at Upstate and working on early studies on dengue vaccine development. But today, there is no vaccine that works well. It's not available in countries like Ecuador. There is no specific medical treatment. And so vector control or prevention of community engagement is really the only way to manage the diseases. And the same is true for chikungunya and Zika. Chikungunya and Zika are transmitted by the exact same mosquito. And so when you think of dengue, now you can think of chikungunya and Zika. They're all co-circulating in these same areas when we work in Ecuador. All three viruses are co-circulating. Brief map showing, this is a map showing the distribution of active Zika transmission. And you can see that it's moved down through Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay. We had our first cases of local uh, dengue or Zika transmission in our field site in Machala in mid-February. So the virus is moving very quickly down through the Americas and throughout all of um, the Caribbean. And it's very hard to tell apart dengue, Zika, and chikungunya infections. They all look like the sort of general febrile illness with rash and joint pain, fever. Um, but of course, I'm sure many of you know that there are potential uh, neurological complications or developmental complications with Zika, which we're just barely beginning to understand right now. There's many, many studies that are coming out uh, this year and in the coming years to be able to, to understand that better. But in the meantime, we can say for sure that all of these diseases are co-circulating, and that is completely changing sort of the landscape of disease transmission, and probably changing the whole immunological landscape also, because Zika is also a flavivirus, like dengue. And so if you've had a previous dengue infection, and then you have Zika, that may make your Zika infection worse than if you had never been exposed to dengue. All these are brand new questions that I think globally researchers are trying to, to understand. So a little bit of background on Ecuador. Ecuador is a small country sandwiched between Colombia and Peru. It's on the equator, that's Ecuador. It's one of the most biodiverse places in the world. You have the Amazon rainforest and cloud, and cloud forests. You have the Andes Mountains, coastal lowlands, where these diseases tend to be uh, hyperendemic. Galapagos Islands. But you also have uh, tremendous uh, social inequalities and income disparities. And so understanding both the biophysical landscape but also the social landscape uh, is really important to understand disease transmission. When we think about climate in this area, we could think about seasonal variations in climate. So very, we have very distinct rainy and dry seasons, periods of short periods of time, several months where most of the rainfall occurs every year. Um, we can think about interannual variability in climate. So this interannual variability would refer to uh, sort of year to year, why you have some extreme events in certain years and maybe three or four years go by and then you have another extreme flood. So that's what we consider interannual variability. These are photos um, they took last April when Maury and I were working together in Cobija in Bolivia. And you can see here, this is the line of the water. So the river had risen 18 meters in this area. And so we were doing work on flooding in different countries in Latin America. This is what we refer to as interannual variability. And these are more images of flooding from the sites we were working in. And just the Sierra Machal, also our main site in Ecuador, we had the worst flooding that we've had in three decades. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of the drivers of interannual variability. And of course, we have climate change, right? So this is a map from the IPCC showing projected surface temperature changes um, from in 2090, right here, 2090 to 2099, so 100 years out or more. Or sorry, around 100 years out. So we have these different time scales of climate, and I think it's really important that we don't confuse these when we talk about how climate affects health. Um, when what we've seen is oftentimes people start to misuse models, and so a model that you would use to explain seasonal variation in climate 
is not the same as the model we would use to explain long-term trends in climate. And so that's something I think that the public health community should be aware of when we start uh, developing these you know, in, uh, interdisciplinary collaborations because there are very different assumptions when we work with different models. And our part, some of my partners at Columbia University are starting to work to separate what they call timescale decomposition. So with precipitation, if we look at precipitation, we see that there are three different timescales. Trend, which is long-term climate change, decadal variability or interannual variability. And so this explains how much of the variation in precipitation can be shown by climate change, by what we call decadal shifts, or interannual, year-to-year -year shifts. So in the case of precipitation, <coughs> Most of the variation of precipitation is year to year. Um, so it may be driven by things more like El Nino events. So El Nino events would be way more important than long-term climate change if you're looking at a disease that's affected by rainfall, for example. In the case of temperature, most of the variation is explained by trend, so long-term climate warming trends. So this is where thinking about climate change, long-term climate warming, that previous map I showed you, may be much more important if you want to understand disease transmission dynamics. You know, decadal and interannual variability are important, but they are much smaller. Uh, proportion. So understanding these nuances of cl climate and time scale is very important for the public health community to start working with the climate sector. So what does all of this have to do with dengue and infectious diseases in Ecuador? Sort of taking a step back. Uh, dengue emerged, re-emerged in Ecuador in the late 1980s as throughout most of Latin America. So some of you may know that dengue was prevalent throughout the Americas, including in the U.S., up through about the 1940s and 50s, through massive campaigns to eradicate yellow fever and malaria through the use of DDT. Dengue fever was also eradicated. So around the 1950s, I know uh, Ecuador was declared dengue free. But then of course everyone said, hooray, we've cured, we are, we've eliminated dengue and we've suppressed malaria and there's no more yellow fever, we have a great yellow fever vaccine. And so many of the vector control programs were dismantled Funding dried up, and then several decades later, of course, the mosquito is back, and the disease is back and stronger than ever. Now we have all four serotypes co-circulating, which is something we didn't see before. And so in the late 1980s, the disease re-emerged in Ecuador. You can see here data from 1994, 2002, and 2012. The top row of maps, this is dengue fever incidence by province. Um, and down here, this is dengue hemorrhagic fever, or the more severe manifestation of the disease. Also incidence by province. And mainly what I want you to see is that it came into the coast, it spread and spread, and now it's, it's prevalent, co-circulating everywhere. These are a little bit difficult to read, but these are actually the serotypes. So all four serotypes are co-circulating in the country. Generally, from year to year, you'll see one serotype that dominates. You might have a few years of dengue 2, dengue 2, dengue 2, with three and four, and one maybe kind of circulating in the background, and then there may be a switch. And that may be due to different serotypes that are moving through the region. We don't really have good data. I think some of the work that we're doing now, some of the studies I'll show you in Ecuador, we're generating some of the first local information on what's actually happening with the genotypes and, and the diversity of dengue virus. But up until I think some of these more recent studies that we're doing now, this is the level of data that we're able to work with. You know, yes or no, dengue 2 was present in a given year in a given province. Interestingly, dengue hemorrhagic fever, which remember before I mentioned that you tend to see dengue hemorrhagic fever when you have second infection, the second strain of dengue. So it makes sense that when you have a situation with more, when you have different serotypes coming into an area and co-circulating, you're going to start seeing more cases of severe disease, right? So in 1994, there were no cases. There had never been a case of dengue hemorrhagic fever in the country. And you can see here, slowly it's coming out. 2002 were the first cases. And now, if you looked at the data today, we have cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever across the country. And so this is really important, obviously, from a burden of disease perspective, because these are cases that are much more severe, lead to hospitalization and death every year. There's a few cases of death, and tend to affect younger children. So from a climate perspective, uh, we know that in this area, uh, well, globally, so from a global climate change perspective, global climate change is projected to increase the frequency of El Nino events. So El Nino events will increase from one event, extreme El Nino events will increase from one event every 20 years to one event every 10 years. What does that mean for a place like Ecuador? Ecuador is extremely affected by El Nino events. This is what we call teleconnections. It's this concept that you have these large scale global atmosphere ocean phenomena that have teleconnections or connections to local climate. So standing here in Boulder, Colorado, or well, 
in Denver, Colorado, or in Boulder, Colorado next door. The local climate is affected by these global scale atmospheric or oceanic uh, climate phenomena, right? And so in the case of El Nino, which is ocean warming, so the sea surface temperature increases, we see very strong effects on local rainfall and temperature. So more rainfall and warmer temperatures in coastal Ecuador where we work. This graph uh, shows correlation. So this is a correlation between El Nino, or sea surface temperature, and local rainfall. And this is the area of northern Peru and Ecuador. You can see along the coast, this red area shows very high correlations. And there's a lag, actually. So it's the correlation between the Oceanic Nino Index, which is sea surface temperature, in October, November, December. And then three months later, you see a strong correlation with rainfall because you have this lag, right? So it makes that sea surface temperature warm three months later. In the areas that are red, you're going to see lots more rainfall. And the map for temperature looks very similar. And so with this sort of background knowledge, we wanted to say, hey, it, can we actually show a link with dengue, um, these large scale phenomena like El Nino and local rainfall? What's, what's going on? And so with my partner, Rachel Lowe, who is the modeler at IC3 in Barcelona, which is a climate and health institute, we started looking at historical time series of dengue and climate and sea surface temperature. So you can see here, this is 1995 through 2010. In 2010, we had the biggest epidemic of dengue in the region. And these are monthly anomalies. And so when it's above zero, that means it's greater than the long-term average. If it's below, in those are years we have less dengue than the long-term average in a given month. This is local climate. So these are, the lines are temperature. So you can, and the bars are rainfall. So this was that very strong, some of you are probably aware that in 1998 we had one of the strongest El Nino events on record, which caused massive flooding and damages in, in areas like coastal Ecuador and other places in the world. You can see very clearly that, that El Nino event, which shows up here too, because this is uh, sea surface temperature, so you have a huge bump in warming. This was that very strong 1997-98 El Nino. And these are anomalies also, so of course this is a period of time when we had warmer than average temperatures and more than average rainfall. So long story short, when we uh, put all of this in a statistical model, and we also included information on stereotypes that were circulating in mosquito abundance, we found that yes, El Nino was a major driver of dengue epidemics. We found more dengue epidemics during El Nino years. And at a local level, minimum temperature and rainfall were the most important climate drivers. So this gave us sort of our first indication at a local scale that climate was affecting dengue transmission. And working with Rachel and her team at IC3, we are now updating these forecasts to create um, seasonal dengue forecasts. And so her collaborators have also developed better El Nino forecasts. So they're actually able to predict El Nino, better predictions of El Nino events. So they can say six months out, will an El Nino occur? And then that's feeding into our model to predict, well, will a dengue epidemic occur? And these are some of the forecasts that Rachel and I have been working on for this year for dengue for Machala, updating that same model, but now using these, um, using these new ways to do forecasting for, for local climate and for El Nino. And you can see here the black line is observed data <coughs> from Machala, <coughs> and the dashed line is the predicted uh, de dengue transmission. And so in 2016, we're expecting to see a very large, a very big dengue transmission year. And this takes into account um, some of the over-reporting that happens because you have chicken, bunny, and Zika all co-circulating together. So I would take this to, I would sort of understand this to mean uh, dengue, chicken, bunny, and Zika year. But these are the kinds of products that we're starting to develop and that we're working on with the Ministry of Health to really create that bridge between the climate science and the public health sector to create tools that we think can actually be useful to inform better decision making. And so we wanted to understand, okay, so why and how is climate affected? Right? We sort of have this general idea that climate affects dengue. We have some biological theory that says you know, warming temperatures would increase you know, metabolic rates and mosquitoes develop faster, um, the virus replicates faster, mosquitoes bite more when it's warmer, and they have more containers and more water when it's warmer. But what, is that, what does that mean? Does that pan out when we actually look at a local level? And so we spent almost a year working with the local Ministry of Health to do a study in 80 households where we did weekly um, surveys to look at numbers of eggs of Aedes aegypti, so it was a sort of indirect indicator of mosquito abundance. And we followed that over that time period in two different sectors in the city. So we had a central area and a peripheral area. Um, so different housing conditions and different access to piped water, different, slightly different demographics, but pretty close together. I mean, this was like a 10 minute walk, right? All in the same periphery of Machala. And these are the buckets we used to look at the 
80s of Egypt, I had to say, low budget <laughs> PhD research. And lots of extensive household survey with heads of households to understand their knowledge, perceptions, and risk factors. And we also did really intensive uh, container surveys in those same households to look for containers where the mosquitoes were breeding and to count the number of mosquito pupae, which is an indirect, uh, an indicator of dengue risk, so the pupal indices. It's a better indicator than some of the more traditional um, entomological indicators. And so we were able to know exactly what kinds of containers, what was the number of pupae per person per household, how that changed seasonally, because we repeated this over three different seasons in these same households. And this is a sort of a summary figure, not to get, to get into the weeds of all of these analyses, but through this we were able to find that there were household risk factors during the rainy season and during the dry season that varied. So household water storage, not the condition of a patio and the house, knowledge of the breeding sites was important during the rainy season. During the dry season, we had different factors like access to piped water, number of families, risk perception, although water storage was persistent both in dry and rainy season. Because remember I mentioned that these mosquitoes are breeding in containers in and around the house. And so people's knowledge, perception, access to piped water uh, affects their risk of dengue transmission. Um, during the rainy season, you know, the, the types of containers were different, and so the types of interventions that you would need if you were in the public health sector would be quite different. So the types of containers that you would target, you know, if you went out and said, okay, we're going to go out and just do this program, we're going to cover containers. Well, that's not going to reduce risk during the rainy season if we know that most of the containers are um, just sort of containers laying in and around the household, but they're not the water storage containers. During the dry season, on the other hand, these were water storage containers you know, filled with tap water. And so having this sort of finer scale understanding can help to inform effective and local interventions. One of the other important outcomes was that we found that the same two climate drivers, minimum temperature and rainfall, were the most important predictors of the mosquito population dynamics. And so this is good news because that's what we found when we did these long-term epidemiological statistical models. So it provided some validation. Okay. So we went a step further and did some more in-depth social science research with these same communities through focus groups to understand community members' perceptions of risk and uh, transmission and uh, barriers to, to control in the household. And so we created these diagrams where we asked them to map out what they thought were the, the causes of dengue in the community. So here, for example, it says, um, because we're not fumigating, okay? We're not fumigating because we don't want to spend money and maybe because people are just careless. Uh, here, was, people were saying, um, one of the issues was mosquitoes. Okay, why are there issues with mosquitoes? Because there's garbage and dirtiness in the community. And it says here, our neighbors throw garbage after the hour, then they're supposed to throw it out. Um, there's dogs that come and break open the bags, and then the garbage collectors don't want to pick up garbage on the street. And so we went through and mapped out and coded all of these different risk factors and found that, of course, not surprisingly, in the urban periphery, people identified many more risk factors than in the central area many more barriers to, uh, to dengue control or prevention. Namely, uh, many were related to resource limitations or you know, the economic situation of the household, and also lack of political access, because remember, these are areas that were not recognized by the municipal governments. They didn't have access, legal access, to things like good piped water. So out of some of the work that we did here, we had the pleasure of having Naveed with us last year to do his capstone work. And Naveed did a more in-depth look at how households are spending money on vector control, what are the barriers to conducting dengue control in the household. And so on Friday, Naveed's going to give us a summary of his capstone findings. We also did some work with local uh, healthcare providers to understand their perceptions of risk and uh, limitations to managing dengue in the community. And I think this provided some, some very interesting information that will help us to target also future um, trainings with the Ministry of Health. And this paper was done by Andrew Handel, who is a med student at Upstate, and we found out just today that it was accepted for publication. Yay. So based on all of these prior studies, when I came to Upstate, we had the, the good fortune to, to secure funding from the Department of Defense to take the work we had done and build what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk as a research platform this integrated approach to studying dengue transmission, vector dynamics, microclimate, nutri nutrition, all of these things together, the, the immunology side, in, in one integrated disease surveillance platform. And so this is the city of Machala that I've been talking so much about. It's a city of about 250,000 people. 
So it's a mid-sized city located about an hour and a half north of the Peruvian border, so in the southern coastal area. It's a port city here, so that's important because there's a lot of movement of people between the border because it's right along the Pan-American Highway, and a lot of movement of people and goods through the port. This area all around is agricultural, so it's a very important agricultural area for bananas, shrimp, a lot of mining higher up in the mountains. Uh, it's a very, uh, very economically active, sort of a bustling city. And Jesse and Lindsay were living there also for a year, working with us to get this project launched in 2013. You can see here in the city we have uh, these triangles are weather stations, so we're able to look at microclimate across the city to see how that might affect the spatial distribution of disease risk. We're working with a network of sentinel clinics here. There's one, two, three, and there's another clinic here and the central hospital, so four sentinel clinics in the central hospital. And I'll explain a little bit more about the, the surveillance protocol. So this has been ongoing since the end of 2013 and continues today. This is pretty much what we are, what I just summed up, but uh, basically it's just a really important strategic location because of its location near the border, and dengue is hyperendemic here. Now Zika and Chikungunya are all co-circulating in the same area. So very high burden of disease. And there's no active malaria transmission, which I'm sure Lindsay could tell you more about since she's working out a case study of why there is no malaria transmission in this region. So this uh, research collaboration is done through a partnership through a large consortium of partners in Ecuador and in the U.S. And in this study, we work with uh, passive surveillance of sus individuals with suspected dengue, Zika, or chikungunya cases who are being referred to us from those sentinel clinics that I showed on the map. So if they show up and they have sort of febrile symptoms, maybe a little joint ache, some rash, then the doctors, the Ministry of Health doctors, will send that individual to our study, uh, our study doctor, our study technician in the hospital here. So Dr. Cynthia Cueva is shown up here. So Kathy receives the patients. And then she does the whole informed consent procedure to make sure that they know what's going on with the, with, if they're willing to participate or not in the study. And then she proceeds to do a pretty extensive um, demographic survey and clinical survey to look at medical history through a database that actually Jesse developed when he was in the field with our team. So it's all on iPads and we use a secure cloud-based server, which is then really an excellent option. And we use the same exact uh, setup when we do the field surveys. Kathy then draws a blood sample and runs rapid diagnostics for dengue. She separates and spins the, the samples and freezes the serum, plasma, and cells at minus 80. We have these dry shippers here, which you can see on the right. So all the samples are stored at, at minus 80 for future studies. And if the patient comes up positive, then we go out in the field and do what we call active surveillance in disease clusters. And so we go to the household of the index patient who was positive, and we repeat this study there. So we ask anyone in the household who's willing to participate whether or not they have symptoms, because we want to be able to pick up asymptomatic individuals. And we uh, repeat the same surveys. We do much more extensive household surveys, look at housing conditions and other uh, social factors. And then our technicians also GPS the location of the household. And they collect adult mosquitoes in and around, inside and outside of the household, using these great lightweight uh, backpack aspirators called Procopacks. And when we collect the adult mosquitoes, we then store them on ice in the field, take them back to the laboratory, and immediately sort and sex them and freeze them at minus 80, also to look for presence of this, uh, the virus in the mosquitoes. So in 2014, we had about almost 500 people who entered the study, coming in through both the active and passive surveillance components. I believe we had about 34 clusters, so it was a tremendous effort by the field team. And you can see here, uh, these are the cluster households, the blue dots that we did in 2014. Um, I think to date, we've had over 800 people enter the study, so over the last three years. These are some of the results from 2014. So this was, I think, one of some of these results we're working on publishing now. This will be one of the first sort of exhaustive or more exhaustive epidemiological studies of dengue in this region. And we were able to show that all four serotypes were co-circulating. And dengue 2 was the dominant serotype. So of the index individuals, so the people who came to us with clinical symptoms of dengue, who came through the, the sentinel clinics, 89% of them had dengue 2. So it was definitely the dominant serotype. This is broken down by index patients. So these are patients coming to the sentinel clinics. Associates are what are referred to as the people in the households out in the community, not including the index patient. And then the cluster would be the index plus the people in the household, right? 
And so if you look at acute infections, that means that they, had, they were either positive for dengue NS1 or PCR positive. 46.6% uh, of index individuals were positive for dengue. And really interesting, in the associates, these are individuals who didn't come to us with dengue, 16% had acute dengue infections. That's a very high prevalence of infection. So at any given time, we have someone coming in, 16% of people in and around the household of that individual have acute dengue infections. When we looked at whether or not they were positive by a broad range of dengue diagnostics, which also includes recent or prior infections, you go across all the way to the end, this was sort of, we had 54% of people in the cluster, so including the initiate case or the index case and the associates were positive uh, for any of the diagnostics. This is also an important line here. This shows the ratio of febrile to afebrile acute cases. And so uh, with the associates, we found a high, high proportion who were afebrile. So a lot of people were, had acute infections. So they were coming up PCR positive for the dengue virus, but they had no fever. Um, and this is what other studies have shown also. So there are a lot of people out there who were able to transmit the virus, most likely, but are not showing any symptoms. So this is another way to show some of that same data. Um, this is what we call an expansion factor. So for every individual, like this child who came into the index, uh, to the central clinic, we want to know how many additional people were in the community with dengue infection in and around that household. On average, we had 16.8% prevalence, and so that would be the equivalent of three additional acute cases for every index case. The maximum during the peak of transmission was 29% prevalence. And so that would mean for every index person who came in positive, we had six additional dengue cases in and around. So like I said, again, very high transit burden of disease and much higher than previously recorded. And right now, we are going back and screening all of our samples back through 2013 to also look for chingunya and Zika. And so we'll have a much better idea about when exactly those viruses came into the population, what's the prevalence of co-infections, and uh, all of those sort of the basic epidemiology of of those three diseases which are co-circulating, because when we started the study in 2004, at the end of 2013 into 2014, only dengue was present. Last year, chikungunya came in. This year, Zika came in. And so each year, we have a very different uh, epidemiological scenario, although it's, it's also possible that Zika came in much before that, and we should be able to find that out from looking at, at our samples. We've also been able to look at uh, dengue primary and secondary cases, so whether it was a first or second infection, using um, the IgG and IgM for, uh, for dengue. And so we can look at age, age classes. So these are the index cases, the people with symptoms who came in through the Sentinel clinics. And we have here this curve of primary dengue, so people are getting their, the peak of their first dengue infections between the ages of five to 10. Then you can see here the second dengue infections are in this, what, like 14 to 19 year old um, age group. And importantly, remember I mentioned before that Secondary infections are at higher risk for severe disease, and so this would be that age group, which is at higher risk for hemorrhagic or dengue shock. And we, can, we were able to look at the same thing when we were looking at the communities and the associate cases. And so when we look at the associate cases, these are people who don't necessarily have any symptoms. They're people who are home and were willing to participate in the study at the time. We found that secondary infections across a, broad, uh, a much broader range of, of ages, and we're seeing a similar peak in, in primary infections in the community. We were also able to look, um, to use some statistical models uh, to look at symptoms and how symptoms vary by primary and secondary infections. Um, so this was a logistic regression model and a multi-model selection package in R called GL Multi. And we put in, uh, a the variable was primary or infection or other for the top model here. And the only important predictor was rash. For the secondary infections, we had a broad range of of symptoms, importantly hospitalization popped out, but of course all the hospitalized cases with, that came out positive were actually secondary cases, and bleeding and drowsiness, so these were all important uh, risk factors for, second, for secondary infections. These are from the index patients, so people who were symptomatic. In the community, people who had secondary cases didn't have any specific symptoms, because you're seeing people with secondary cases who may who are largely asymptomatic, or there's, it seems to be much more difficult to, to pick up secondary case if you just went out in the community and surveyed for it. So that study is ongoing and has, is being expanded right now, as I mentioned, for Zika and chikungunya. We also have support from NSF 
um, to begin a new study, which we're right in the middle of, of launching that this month, which is a three-year cohort study to look at dengue, Sika, and microclimate in four different locations in the province. So this is actually, there's another site right here next door. This is Machala, where we've been talking about. Wakia is a very dry, hot area right on the border. And then Saruma and Portobello are right at the margin of dengue transmission. So this is around 1,200 meters, higher elevation. And just last year, there was the first case of local, uh, locally acquired dengue in Saruma. And so we'll be placing microclimate sensors in people's households and doing biweekly mosquito collections and blood draws over the study period to look at uh, disease transmission dynamics. And just Monday, we were awarded a NSF Zika rapid grant. So I'm the PI on that one, which is allowing us to expand that study to do more of the, the human research component, the, the blood draws. And because the, the original study was more focused on the entomology side of things. And that study, the, the EEID study, uh, and this whole work that we're doing with the new cohort is largely based on work done by a group um, that came out of NCS originally, this National Center for Ecological Synthesis, and is now being led by Aaron Mordecai at Stanford. And Aaron's group has done some really nice work to look at these uh, traditional models of malaria. Um, and she and her team have basically gone in and said, many of these traditional malaria models, the assumptions that they're using is sort of the underlying mathematics is just wrong. You know, they're looking at many of these models assume like a linear relationship. So when temperature increases, all of these different life traits uh, or, you know, virus replication rates or parasite replication rates, mosquito development rates, they're assuming linear responses. So increasing temperature, more mosquitoes, you know, for many of these different parameters. And what she and her colleagues are, have showed empirically is that that's just wrong. I mean, I think it's kind of logical. We all know that in biology, you see a curve to some extent. You see a peak, you see an increase, you get to an optimum. For, for whatever biological process you want to talk about, and then if it gets too hot, things drop off pretty quickly. And so they went back in and basically updated those traditional models using these new curves, these new uh, fits. And with their work, they were able to show um, that the, this changed dramatically. So they found that their optimum was lower than had previously predicted. They found optimal malaria transmission at 25 degrees whereas previously optimal transmission had been 31. So it's a six degree shift, which has major implications when we're thinking about large scale predictions of which areas are currently and will be at risk of malaria, right? When we're doing these, uh, especially these big mapping efforts to look at which areas of Africa will be at risk of, of malaria under future climate change scenarios, a six degree shift is pretty major. Um, and so we're rerunning this similar analysis right now with, with dengue and Zika. And those are to be published soon, so. This is a bit of a, a divergence, but because I mentioned waterborne pathogens at the end, I wanted to, to share this with you also. Um, we did a one-year project to look at cholera in the estuarine system and climate drivers and environmental drivers of uh, cholera risk. So Vibrio cholera uh, and cholera swept through the Americas in the 1990s um, when it first came in up the coast from Peru and it came into Ecuador. It came, it, it emerged and exploded right in this area where we're working. It was one of the highest burden areas. Uh, after Peru had the highest burden of cholera during that epidemic in the 90s, Ecuador had the second highest burden of cholera. And so we had a sense that this area was um, sort of environmentally optimal for cholera transmission, but nobody had gone back to look. And previous studies had also shown that cholera can persist in ocean waters and may be associated with copepods in the ocean waters, which can actually act as vectors because the cholera bacteria will bind to the copepod. And so we wanted to get a sense of, was there Vibrio cholera uh, in these estuarine waters? Was there toxigenic Vibrio cholera or not? What were the environmental parameters? What were the climate drivers? And so this work, is, some of this is still ongoing. Um, and Sadie Ryan at University of Florida is leading this effort. And so with this field study, we're looking at these sort of spatial distribution of Vibrio cholera risk and these environmental parameters. But one of the other uh, analyses or papers that came out of this same grant was a global uh, study to look at cholera under climate, future climate change scenarios, looking at the, the key ecological drivers of, of cholera risk. This was a nice paper done by our postdoc, Luis Escobar. And so he looked at current climate conditions and suitability, so using what we call ecological niche models, where you can put together a whole range of different environmental parameters that we know affect cholera in these estuarine systems, like pH, salinity, uh, chlorophyll A concentrations, which are indicators of the, the plankton in the water. And so Luis created a, a global map to show uh, 
areas that were most suitable for cholera today. So these are the red areas in the, in the ocean waters. And then using the IPCC models, he projected that to look at future areas at risk for cholera transmission. So this is an example of how we can understand disease transmission dynamics using climate change models instead of some of these other models I talked about, which were more like seasonal forecast models. And some of this work has also spun out to look at flooding and community perceptions of flooding and flood risk and early warning systems. So as I mentioned before, we were in Bolivia last year working with communities that have been strongly affected by flooding. And we have repeated these studies in Ecuador and the Dominican Republic. And we'll be back there actually in, a few, in two weeks and 10 days to, to continue this work. And so we worked with community members. So similar to some of the work we did before with dengue with the, with the focus groups, we did a lot of participatory mapping to understand their history, exposure to flooding, what were the impacts in the community, public health impacts or, and other impacts, the most vulnerable people. And we had them do community timelines to indicate when and where people have been affected, how deep were the, were the flooding events. And this was led by our project manager, Erica Tauser, who really did an excellent job of working in partnership with the National Secretary of Risk and a broad range of other academic partners here. So, you can see them going out in the field with community leaders to GPS the coordinates and to do some field validation of, of the results that came up in the focus groups. And Erica then translated these to maps in ArcGIS to look at areas that have been affected by flooding historically in these, area, in these communities. So you can see here this is a normal year. The blue areas are areas affected by flooding. These were a few extreme years, so 2002, 2007, 2012. This was during the extreme year, so you see most of the communities underwater. And then they went in and identified specific areas that they were concerned, uh, the community members were concerned about. And so this, these reports have been now turned into the local government. And so this doesn't have a direct, this project doesn't have a direct link with infectious diseases, but clearly it's re relevant and related um, because these are areas, these are communities that are exposed to annual flooding and extreme flooding events every several years. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we have uh, a lot of leptospirosis, um, typhoid, other waterborne pathogens that are affecting public health in these areas, diarrheal diseases, and then diseases like dengue and Zika and chimpunya that emerge after a flood. And so our, our goal would be to take this work the next step further to incorporate the infectious disease component and to be able to really link um, our work with the Secretary of Risk, with the public health sector, and the climate communities to, to pull together more integrated interventions. Okay, so for a completely different note, that's, that's the end of my side of the research talk. But I thought it, since we have a captive audience, I thought it was incredibly relevant to share with you what's actually going on in Ecuador right now. So probably some of you may know that uh, several weeks ago, three weeks ago, about, uh, there was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake in Ecuador. Over 500 people were killed. It's probably closer to 1,500 from what I've heard on the ground. 25,000 people are currently sleeping outdoors and they're, you know, makeshift tents uh, without access to water sanitation. So and this is true to this day. This is some of the damage in some of the areas that we were working in. When the earthquake hit, we mobilized our research team and immediately went to the site without exactly, we didn't have a, quite a plan in mind, but we knew that we wanted to be there and to help. And we were able to basically get the backing from SUNY Upstate to use the research dollars we had on the ground to purchase medication supplies and just do whatever we could do. And so. We, we knew we needed to be there, and so we went to Valle de Caracas, which is a city of 20,000 people, um, which will largely be leveled in the next few weeks, uh, those buildings that are still, still standing. You can see here, these are photos from right near where we were camped out. This is a major landslide that happened, so there were towns that were completely flattened, other areas that have major structural damage. Um, this has just been completely devastating for the country, and this just happened a few weeks ago. So I was there camping out and working on this project up until like last week when I flew back to the US and now I'm here with you guys. These are pictures of the military distributing water because everyone's piped water supply has been completely damaged. So in areas that didn't have good piped water before, now there's no piped water. And so we started working with the Ministry of Health. We did what we know how to do. <laughs> started we're partnering with our Ministry of Health partners and said, hey, how can we help? And so we started walking through the communities, helping with some of the needs assessments. And through a series of fortunate uh, connections, we were able to connect with uh, a local school that provides free education to community members. So the school provides free private education to 220 families in this area. And they opened their doors to us. Luckily, their structures were not damaged at all. They opened their doors to us and said, yes, come. 
you know, do what you need to do. And so we took over one of the classrooms where we set up our camp stove and our tents were there. And we took over one of the other classrooms and turned it into a clinic. And just sort of by the magic of being there, we, you know, we had doctors, medical volunteers kind of join our team once, you know, once you build it, they'll come. And so we had Chilean doctors, American doctors, American nurses who were working with us, volunteering, everyone sleeping in tents, um, totally makeshift, I say. And we, since this was three weeks ago, we've been seeing 100 people a day at the clinic. And I just heard yesterday, the US nurse volunteered to stay on longer. And so he's still there working with our Ministry of Health Partners to operate the clinic at the school. And there, people are still just pouring in. And we were working also to distribute water at the school. It was one of our partners in Quito was able to get water to be donated. This is one of the patients who we worked with who improved dramatically during the, just the time we were there. But you know, many, I think you really get a better understanding of what vulnerability means when you're thinking it, when you, when you see people, you see the faces of people and elderly, many young pregnant women newborn infants sleeping outdoors in makeshift tents. That's sort of where you really understand what vulnerability means. And these are areas where Zika and Dengue are also endemic and co-circulating. And so people are incredibly vulnerable to the epidemics that will be emerging you know, post-disaster. And these are some of the team of doctors who we worked with there who were incredible and the director of the school who opened the doors to us. And we were able to partner with different international NGOs who are uh, we're there to provide free water filters to the community because I mentioned before water is a major problem and we had uh, great support also from the local military who came in. So as I, I mentioned before our team has been providing medical care to about 100 people per day over the last few weeks and it just seems it keeps going. We're actually shocked. I just talked to David our nurse yesterday and he said we had 85 people came through the door. We couldn't see everyone. We had 20 people more. And we anticipate it'll be like this for a while because there's very limited primary health care. And so uh, our goal is to keep providing medical services in the community for this a six month period of time, sort of our short term immediate goal to help during this gap while so people can get their feet under them and get their houses rebuilt. And so we are looking for help. And this one that, you know, spread the word if you know of medical practitioners, nurses, public health people who want to come and help and I think all goodwill and good energy is welcome. And we've been accepting donations also through the SUNY Upstate Foundation, and all of the money that goes through there is going directly to our field team to purchase medical supplies in country. So I want to recognize everybody who has been part of this amazing team. And this is truly a team effort. This is not the work of one person. Thank you. If they were immunized, they wouldn't. They shouldn't have an acute infection. But because they have this acute infection, uh, then subsequently they're going to be have protection against whatever. Oh, you're saying the people are being that it's sure. yeah, right. So there, are, there's a ton of dengue circulating, which is why basically by the time you're 16 to 19 years old in this population, you know, the not, your your likelihood of having dengue drops off because you've been naturally immunized, like you said. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Right? Because there's such a high burden of disease. Most people are exposed, you know, you can, by the time you're 20. Or your second, your second infection by the time you're 20. Uh, could you also say something about the, uh, the geographic distribution of serotypes? Is it mm -hmm. totally mixed, or are there trends in that? So that's, and within the city, that's something we're still looking at. So I can't comment on that yet. Um, at sort of a city or regional-wide, it's all mixed. I mean, at a very fine scale at the household level, that's one of the questions we want to look at. We don't know yet, but I think with with the three years of data, we now have a big enough population to be able to answer some of those questions because we've now done about 50 clusters. And so I think we can really start to ask those questions. Although, you know, I think as you saw, the vast majority of cases are you know, one serotype too. So we're, yeah, that's a really good question. And also how the genotypes with the mosquitoes and the humans are, are distributed spatially. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of myths out there, mm -hmm. especially between that if you get dengue here, you're you know, more likely to get it again in Southeast Asia. 
mm -hmm. vice versa, but I, I've never heard any real scientific evidence of that. So. I think you're likely to get dengue anywhere you're traveling with dengue endemic. <laughs> yeah. And you might have already had it if you were there. You just didn't know. Although if the second one's more acute, then maybe yeah. you're more likely to experience it the second mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's true. <laughs> on your second trip to a dengue endemic area, you may be more likely to have a, an acute uh, infection, or a more severe infection. Yes, Rosemary. Thanks, Liz, you want to progress. Um, when you look, sort of following up on the secondary, the, the associates, um, mm -hmm. you have the age of infection is actually uh, really like three to five years of age for the average age um, of the associates. For the, uh, uh, for the non symptomatic ones? Please go back one more slide. Yeah, yeah. The average age is good at five point three years. This is just average age of pe the people in the study. Uh, so what was the yeah. average age of the ones that were infected? That's a good question. Well, these are the uh, this is the results from the IG from the primary and secondary data, which isn't exactly the same as the the acute infections. So we could we'd have to rerun it for but acute it's, infections. It's that they're, um, they're spread out so much then. With the secondary infections. Yeah. Mm. I'm just curious about what what predicts somebody who's going to be asymptomatic, they mm -hmm. move positive versus symptomatic, they be fine. Mm -hmm. And if we could use this data to kind of tease that out, mm -hmm. kind of dive in a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. and maybe look at the immunology. Yes, immunology. Yeah, so definitely. That's good questions. And we're also going back and doing exhaustive um, chart reviews on these individuals, or the hospitalized individuals at least, to be able to look at a whole broad range of their whole clinical course of infection, their vital signs, all the labs over that time period also. So we'll have a team of upstate med students doing that this summer. Thank you very much. Actually, I'll be here the next few days. So a chat with anybody anytime my email or you can contact Lindsay Holden or whoever I think my email is at the end of the talk there yeah thank you